what I want to focus on here is things that are relatively new. Okay, so things that you are not likely to find in any of the newer books. And what I mean by that is uh, a lot of the newer research today focus not just on the effect of the herbs that relieve pain or reduce inflammation, because that's very general. Uh, some of the research that I've done in the last five years or so are becoming more and more specific. Uh, how they treat certain pathways of the inflammatory process, how they affect certain part of the immune system. And the reason I think this is the case is because drugs have not done what they are supposed to. They are, you know, they may be effective, but they cause a lot of side effects. They may not be very effective. At the same time, they cause a lot of side effects. So what happened is uh, the drug company, the herb company, the company that sells supplements and so on, they are trying to see whether they come up, can come up with newer entities, newer molecules, newer supplements, or newer drugs that can help to treat inflammatory disorders really with better efficacy and with less side effects. So what happened is when you think about inflammatory disorders, you really have many, many different causes. Some of them are caused by infection, bacterial infection, virus infection, and fungal infection. Even though the infection may be gone, but some of the endotoxin, some of the virus, some of the fungus may still remain in the body. They may not be symptomatic, but gradually they trigger other immune-related inflammatory disease. Others, more traditional, may include metabolic type of, metabolic type of arthritis, such as gout. There may be autoimmune disorder, and this is once again becoming very, very common. You have rheumatoid, you have lupus, you have many others. It may be neuropathic, you may be chronic wear and pain, such as structural degeneration of bone and cartilage, including osteoporosis and osteoarthritis, and then lastly, non-articular. In Western medicine, you have the infectious, you have metabolic, you have you know, all these causes of um, this disease. But what happened is in Chinese medicine, these are what we consider as wind, cold, and damp, or wind heat. So this is kind of like the infection component, isn't it? You know, kind of, the, kind of like the virus and the bacteria. You also have patients that have the metabolic, such as gout or maybe rheumatoid arthritis. This is more like the heat or the damp heat type of B syndromes. You also have patients that have chronic wear and tear, right? So when you have chronic wear and tear, then what happens? Obviously, you have a lot of deficiency. So this is more like the lower right-hand corner where you have liver and kidney indeficiency. You have indeficiency heat and yang deficiency. So once again, your uh, differential diagnosis in Western medicine and Chinese medicine do correlate fairly well with each other. They are Western causes of arthritis, inflammatory disease that correlate very well to the wind, the cold, and damp type of conditions. You have the strong inflammatory conditions like gout and rheumatoid arthritis that correlate very well to heat and damp heat. And finally, the chronic is uh, as correlates with the deficiency. All right, so this is how you can begin to think about the disease from both Western and TCM perspective. Now, as far as the drug goes, drug, there are many different categories of drugs. You have your traditional NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitors, steroids, immune suppressants, opioids, antidepressants, and so on and so forth. And what happened is we basically agree that most of the herbs that treat these inflammatory disorders basically clear heat. Because after all, inflammation is to set on fire Therefore, in order to clear the fire, we must use some type of heat clearing single herbs or heat clearing formulas. And that includes the heat clearing single herbs over here, okay, which is probably no less than 50 or 60. And also the heat clearing formulas, which is probably no less than 40 or 50. And you're probably wondering, uh, if you're look, you know, watching this from the webinar, you probably cannot see it, it's too small. And I actually did this on purpose, you know, to impress you, impress on you that there are so many heat chlorine single herbs and so many heat chlorine formulas, how would you know which one to choose? Right? Because what happened is even though they all fall under the umbrella of heat chlorine herbs and formulas, they have very different pharmacological effect. Some have antibacterial effect, some have antiviral effect, some have antifungal effect, some are anti-cancer. Some are anti-amoebic, some are anti-pyretic, and many are anti-inflammatories. So how do you know which chlorine herb has anti-inflammatory effect and which ones have everything else? So here to narrow down is a list of anti-inflammatory herbs. And once again, there are still many, many to choose from. 
And the reason is because some of these anti-inflammatory herbs are indeed from the heat clearing categories. But what happened is some are from herbs that dispel wind cold and dampness because those herbs treat arthritis and B syndrome very well. Some others are maybe from uh, herbs that release the exterior. Some may be from herbs that tonify the interior. So you may wonder, how does an herb that tonify the interior have anything to do with anti-inflammatory effect? Okay, how does an herb that releases the exterior treat anti-inflammatory disorders? Okay, so once again, this is where knowing the pharmacology of the herb comes in very, very handy. Because what happens is, even though when we look at the formulas, they are formula that treat the excess, they are formula that treat the deficiency, they are formula for blood stagnation, they are formula for chi, you know, stasis. They all play a role to treat the inflammatory disorder. And the answer, the key is, it's really in the pharmacological effect of the herbs. Let's go back to our inflammatory pathways, all right, starting from injury to orthotonic acid to the many different enzymes that contribute to the inflammatory pathways, all right. So now here's the research. How do the herbs work within the scheme of inflammatory pathways? And let me get, just give you some examples. All right. The first one is Fangji Stephania, or Stephania tetrendra. This herb, technically speaking, is an herb that is spelled wind dam. Okay, but what happened is this herb really has two very marked effects. One is it's a great analgesic herb, and the other is it's a great anti-inflammatory herb. The analgesic herb, it, it comes from a compound called the DL tetrahydropalmitin, and this is an active ingredient that's also in Corydalis. And this is a very compound that has an excellent analgesic effect, and we'll talk about analgesic e effect a little bit later when we talk about Yen Hu's or Corydalis, but for now, what happened is uh, Fangji, uh, Stefania also contains a compound called Tetrendrin, which has a very effective anti-inflammatory effect. It blocks both COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes, but primarily is a stronger COX-2. And that's why you see a larger X for COX-2 and a small, uh, smaller X for COX-1. So basically it works very well for treating all types of inflammatory conditions. Another herb that works very well is Zimu Animarina. Okay, Zimu, as we know, is a herb that works very well to clear heat, especially deficiency heat. And what it does in this case is it blocks COX-2 uh, enzyme to decrease the production of prostaglandin. Therefore, you decrease vasodilation, you decrease erythema, you decrease the local warmth, and that's how, how, how it clears heat from a pharmacological perspective. All right, and what happened is Zimu is frequently used along with an herb called Huang Bai Philodendron. Okay, and Huang Bai in this case works on a immunological perspective to block the pro-inflammatory cytokines, which in turn reduce the inflammation and treat the inflammatory disorders. And the cytokine that it blocks include tumor necrosis factor, includes interleukin, and also nitric oxide. So as you can see, Zimu, Animarina, and Huang Bai historically have been frequently used together because they have been used for synergistic effect. And as you can see from these pathways, they actually work on different inflammatory pathways. Therefore, they complement each other and have synergistic effect, both from a traditional use and also from an inflammatory pathway perspective. Okay, another two herbs that are very important are the aconite herbs, including Zi Chuan Wu Aconite Preparata and Zi Cha Wu Aconite Kuzna Zofi Preparata, so different prepared aconite roots. These two herbs in, in the past have been used as very warm and hot herbs to dispel the cold and also cold obstruction that block the channel and collaterals. Okay, according to pharmacology, we know today that these two herbs work very well to block the synthesis of interleukins, therefore have very powerful anti-inflammatory effect. What's also interesting is these two herbs have been researched today quite a bit on their analgesic as well. So not only is it an anti-inflammatory, it's also an anti-analgesic. And how it's supposed to work, as far as we know today, is that it interferes with the sodium channel, which is the middle of the slide here, to interfere with the transmission of the pain signals from the peripheral peripheral parts of the body to the central nervous system. And if you can somehow block that pain signal 
what happened is the peripheral parts of the body may still be experiencing pain, but what happened is the brain may not necessarily get the same signal. All right. So this is very important because now what happened is you block the pain with the analgesic effect of the herb. The herbs also have an analgesic anti-inflammatory effect to block the inflammation. So you are basically, you know, literally killing the two birds with one stone as these two herbs both have multiple mechanisms of action. And the people that are doing these research today, believe it or not, is actually the Harvard Medical School. Okay, so we'll see. When they are done, maybe there will be another um, release medical journal basically uh, describing in more detail how these aconite herbs really work. Uh, obviously, uh, if you hear about this, uh, don't just rush out and start to use aconite for everybody because there's a lot of safety concerns associated with the proper use of these herbs. So before you use them, make sure you read more about these herbs on uh, what are the potential cautions, contraindications, side effects, and so on, because these two herbs are considered in Chinese medicine to be toxic. All right, so uh, if you have a patient that have pain characterized by cold, then obviously zi chuan wu and zi cao wu are two of the best herbs to use. And like I said, make sure you use it for the right patients, for the right diagnosis. Uh, use it at the low dose. Make sure both of the herbs are properly prepared, uh, which means uh, to be treated by heat, boiling temperature for at least one hour or two. So you can minimize aconitine alkaloids, which are the toxic components in the herbs. All right. Another herb that's very important is Dangui Angelica sinensis. Uh, we use Dangui quite a bit. In Chinese medicine, this is basically a herb that tonifies the blood. But what happened is Dangui also contains Dangui tail, Dangui wei, right? So when you prescribe Dangui, invariably, you know, some of the Dangui tail comes along with it. And Dangui tail is a blood moving herb. So anytime you move blood, chances are you'll have some effect to relieve the pain as well. So overall, what happened with Dangui Angelica sinensis and maybe the tail parts is that it has a very strong anti-inflammatory effect as well. So in most cases, it's described to have a COX-1 and COX-2 inhibiting type of effect. So it works great for decreasing the vascular uh, dilation, decreasing the permeability, um, reduce edema, reduce inflammation, and so on. And as far as side effect goes, we really haven't seen it. Uh, if anything, uh, use of Dangui may increase bleeding because it does have some phytocoumarins. It really doesn't increase any clotting. All right. What also happened is Dangui is frequently used with a blood moving herb called Chuan Xiong, commonly known also as Sinidium or Ligusticum. And the reason is because Dangui tonifies the blood, Chuan Xiong moves the blood, and you want to tonify the blood without causing stagnation. So once again, the two herbs have synergistic effect with each other to increase the therapeutic effect and minimize the side effect. And in this case, what happened is the combination of these two herbs will not only work on the traditional inflammatory pathways, they will also block some of the immune-mediated pro-inflammatory pathways, including blocking the tumor necrosis factor, nitric oxide, and also the nf kappa b All right, so once again, you can see the use of these two herbs are very, very powerful to treat many different type of inflammatory disease. And that's why, historically, you have many formulas that are based on Dang Gui or the formula that contains these two herbs, such as Si Wu Tang for substance decoction. So for women that have dysmenorrhea, menstrual pain, uh, characterized also by blood deficiency, use of Si Wu Tang for substance decoction is very good to tonify the blood and at the same time relieve a lot of these pain. That's also why you have a formula called Dang Gui Nian Tong Tang Dang Gui decoction to lift or relieve the pain that also uses these herbs as the main therapeutic herbs.